So here we are back again with the second Kubernetes release of the year, 1.31. Kubernetes 1.31 brings many improvements with 45 features advancing in this release. Of these, 11 have reached stable status. Additionally, 12 new alpha features are making their debut, adding even more functionality to Kubernetes. My name is Mumshad Manambet, and this is Code Cloud. Developing and maintaining the Kubernetes project requires a tremendous amount of effort, yet there is never a shortage of people who consistently show up with enthusiasm, smiles, and a sense of pride in contributing and being part of the community. This spirit we see from both new and seasoned contributors is a testament to the vibrancy and joy of the community. With that in mind, the theme for this release is Eli. The Eli theme is inspired by a joyful dog wearing a sailor's cap, representing the diverse and committed Kubernetes community. With Kubernetes version 1.31, Eli, we celebrate the lively and joyful spirit that makes the Kubernetes community so unique. So we have selected five features that have received a lot of attention. Let's start with the most exciting change in this release. So Kubernetes is now compatible with all cloud providers, or simply Kubernetes goes cloud neutral. So in Kubernetes, in-tree integrations refer to the built-in components that support various cloud providers directly within the core Kubernetes code base. For instance, if you have a Kubernetes cluster running on AWS, the in-tree integrations would include the necessary code to manage AWS resources like the EBS storage or ELS be load balancers directly from Kubernetes. Starting from Kubernetes version 1.26, the project began transitioning these integrations out of the core code base. This process known as externalization means that the code to interact with cloud services is no longer included directly in Kubernetes, but is maintained as a separate component. The code specific to cloud providers is now moved to a new component called the cloud controller manager, and the respective cloud vendors are responsible for building and maintaining their own cloud controller managers. Now, there are several reasons for this change. Firstly, it makes Kubernetes truly vendor neutral, meaning it doesn't favor any specific cloud provider. This makes Kubernetes more versatile and adaptable to different environments. Secondly, externalizing integrations allows each cloud provider's integration to be developed, updated, and maintained independently of the Kubernetes release cycle. And this leads to faster improvements and fixes. And finally, removing this integration simplifies the Kubernetes core, making it more secure and easier to maintain, just like how the SpaceX Raptor engines evolved over time. With the third version, a lot of complexities were removed and optimized, making it more easier to maintain, if you're a SpaceX fan. So despite the removal of entry integrations, you can still integrate Kubernetes with cloud providers using external integrations or cloud controller managers. So these can be either part of the Kubernetes project, but hosted separately or provided by third-party developers or the cloud providers themselves. For example, instead of using the entry integration for AWS EBS volumes, you can use the AWS EBS CSI or the Container Storage Interface Driver, which is an external component maintained by AWS. So you can check out these types of Kubernetes projects hosted separately for AWS Azure or GCE by using the links in the comments below. Now, next, we will take a look at one of the most useful features in Kubernetes graduating to stable in the 1.31 release. So that's the app armor support in Kubernetes. So imagine a Kubernetes environment hosting multiple applications and each running its own container. So this is a common scenario in a multi-tenant setup where different applications or services share the same cluster. So if one of these containers gets compromised, it could potentially access sensitive data or interfere with other containers. For example, a compromised container might try to read passwords from other containers or modify critical system files on the host, posing a risk to the entire system. Without a way to enforce strict security rules, managing and securing these applications in Kubernetes becomes a challenging task. Kubernetes 1.31 addresses these issues by adding support for AppArmor, a Linux tool that lets you set rules on what programs can do. So think of AppArmor as like a security guard for your applications. It ensures that the applications only do what they're supposed to do. So this new feature allows developers to define the security rules directly within the Kubernetes configuration for their applications, making it easier to secure containerized workloads. So AppArmor works by attaching profiles to applications or containers. So these profiles specify what actions the program can and cannot perform. For instance, you can create a profile that allows an application to read certain files, but not write to them. And this helps prevent unauthorized actions and limits the potential damage if an application is compromised. So by integrating AppArmor into Kubernetes, you can now specify these security profiles directly in your app's Kubernetes configuration. 
application. This means each container or pod can have its own set of security rules that the container runtime enforces. And if an application tries to perform an action outside of its allowed profile, AppArmor blocks it, thereby preventing potential security breaches. Let's walk through a simple example to see how App Armor can be used in Kubernetes. First, you define an App Armor profile on your host system. Here's a basic profile saved as the slash etc apparmor.d custom profile. And this profile allows reading from the Etsy password file, but denies writing to the Etsy shadow file. Next, we load the profile into AppArmor within the AppArmor parser command like this. So now you update your Kubernetes pod specification to include the AppArmor profile. And here's how you can do it. So in this YAML configuration, the annotation container.apparmor.security.beta.kubernetes.io slash app container specifies that the app container should use the custom profile, AppArmor profile. Now, implementing AppArmor in production comes with its own challenges. So you need to create detailed profiles for each container to prevent attacks without hindering daily operations. Additionally, managing multiple profiles across all Kubernetes nodes can be complex as each node must have the correct profiles loaded and updated consistently. So the Cube App Armor Manager tool simplifies managing AppArmor profiles across your Kubernetes cluster. It helps distribute and update profiles, ensuring consistent security policies are enforced on all nodes. Next, we will look into another very useful feature graduating to beta in this release, which is the new custom profile section for the kubectl debug command. So as you may know already, the Kubernetes provides a command called the kubectl debug to help developers and administrators troubleshoot running applications. And this command allows you to create a debugging session in a running pod, which is especially useful when dealing with issues in containerized applications. Now, previously, kubectl debug provided predefined profiles for debugging, but these were often insufficient for specific needs. So users might need to add environment variables, replicate volume mounts, or adjust security context to mask the problematic container's environment. Additionally, a shell-less base images, so container images without a shell like bash, pose a challenge because they improve security but make debugging difficult since commands can't be run directly inside the container. Now, without customizable profiles, users had to manually patch pod specifications, which was cumbersome and impractical for frequent debugging tasks. So the new custom profiling feature in Kubernetes 1.31 addresses these limitations by allowing users to define their own debugging profiles. So this feature enhances the flexibility and effectiveness of the kubectl debug command by letting you pass a JSON file that specifies the container configuration you need. So with the custom profiling feature, you can create a JSON file that includes fields compatible with the core v1 container specification. So the core v1 container is a standard Kubernetes object that defines the configuration for a container, including details like ports, environment variables, and resource limits. Now, when you use the custom profile, Kubernetes will merge it with the predefined profile, allowing your custom settings to override the defaults. So here's a simple example of how to use a custom profile with the kubectl debug command. So you create a custom profile JSON file, and then you save the following JSON file as a custom profile.json, and then you use the custom profile with the kubectl debug command. So you run the following command to start a debugging session with your custom profile. In this example, the custom profile specifies port configurations, resource limits, and environment variables that will be used in the debug container. This flexibility ensures that the debug environment closely matches the actual running environment of the application. So custom profiles not only solve the limitation of predefined profiles, but also allow you to handle the challenges of debugging shellless base images. So with custom profiles, you can now mount necessary tools and resources into the debug container, even if the original container image lacks a shell. And this makes it possible to run commands and perform thorough debugging without compromising the security benefits of using uh, shellless base images. Now, Kubernetes has introduced significant improvements to the kube proxy ingress, thereby enhancing connectivity reliability. And this is graduating to stable. So let's take a look at what it is about. Now, let's assume you run an online store with a Kubernetes cluster handling a lot of traffic. And one day you decide to reduce the number of nodes because traffic is low. And this decision could have led to some issues with how traffic was managed, but the new enhancements make everything smoother. So let's see what, what I mean by that. So before the enhancement, when you terminated nodes to downscale a Kubernetes cluster, those nodes might still receive new traffic, leading to failed connections and a poor user experience. Additionally, the health checks used to determine if nodes were healthy weren't always reliable, especially for services set to accept traffic from any node in the cluster. So this is known as external traffic policy cluster. So with the new enhancement, Kubernetes ensures that when a node is shutting down, it stops receiving new traffic and allows existing connections to finish 
English smoothly. So how does it do that? Now this is achieved by the Q proxy detecting a specific signal on the node called to be deleted by cluster autoscaler taint. Now in Kubernetes, as you probably already know, a taint is a special marker applied to nodes that can influence scheduling decisions. So in this context, the to be deleted by cluster autoscaler taint indicates that a node is about to be terminated. When Q proxy detects this taint, it fails its health check, signaling the load balancer to stop sending new traffic to the node. This way, the node can gracefully complete its current task without disruption. And in our online store example, using external traffic policy, the cluster might lead to problems if terminating nodes still receive traffic. So the enhancement solves this by ensuring terminating nodes stop receiving new traffic. To make health checks more reliable, a new endpoint called the live ZE has been added. This endpoint provides a clear status of Kube proxy itself, indicating whether it is functioning properly. Now, unlike previous health checks, this one focuses solely on the health of Kube proxy, making it better indicator of its actual status. So for your online store, this means that the system will have a more accurate view of whether Kube proxy is working correctly, avoiding false positives or negatives. So this enhancement also provides guidance for cloud providers on performing better health check for services using the external traffic policy cluster option. Now, while it does not enforce uh, a standard method, it encourages cloud providers to adopt uh, best practices through documentation and recommendations. And this improves the overall reliability of health checks across different cloud environments, ensuring that the health of your service is accurately monitored and managed. In the Kubernetes 1.31 release, a significant quality of life improvement has been introduced, a randomized algorithm for pod selection during the downscaling of replica sets, which is graduating to stable. So a replica set in Kubernetes, as you obviously know, ensures that a specified number of pod replicas are running at any given point of time. And it helps maintain the desired state of your application by creating or deleting pods as needed. Now, when you scale up a replica set, you add more replicas to handle increased load. And when you scale down, you reduce the number of replicas to save resources. Now, currently, when Kubernetes is downscales a replica set, it prefers to delete the pods that have been running for the shortest amount of time. And this approach tries to minimize disruption by assuming that newer pods are serving fewer clients. However, this can cause issues, especially in high availability scenarios where pods are distributed across multiple failure domains, such as different availability zones in a cloud environment. Now, the new randomized algorithm mitigates this issue by introducing randomness into the selection of pods for termination. This means that instead of always removing the newest pods, Kubernetes will make more balanced decisions that better preserve the distribution of pods across a different failure domains. So let's look at an example to make this more clearer. So imagine you have a replica set with six pods eventually distributed across three availability zones with two pods in each zone. And if one of these zones experiences a failure and becomes unavailable, Kubernetes detects this and attempts to maintain the desired number of pods by creating new ones in the remaining zone. So if zone C goes down, the replica set controls will create three pods in each zone, A and B, resulting in three pods in each of these zones. Now, suppose the failed zone Z comes back online. To balance the load, you decide to scale up the replica set to nine pods, which leads to three pods being scheduled in zone C. As a result, each of the three zones now has three pods. Now later, when the demand decreases, you decide to scale down the replica set back to six pods. And with the current algorithm, Kubernetes would likely remove the three newest pods, which could all be from zone C, causing an imbalance again, leaving zones A and B with three pods each and zone C with none. So with the new randomized algorithm, Kubernetes will select pods for termination in a more balanced manner. Instead of always removing the newest pods, in it randomly chooses which pods to terminate, ensuring that the distribution across all zones remains more even. So this helps maintain stability and high availability by preventing any single zone from becoming underrepresented. So this enhancement improves the balance of pod distribution across failure domains, enhancing high availability and reducing the risk of significant disruption by avoiding the removal of all pods from a single domain. It also ensures a fairer approach to pod termination, preventing certain pods from being consistently chosen over the others. Now, there are several other features graduating to beta and stable status that we discussed and explained in our previous release, videos of versions 1.30, 1.21, 1.28, and 1.27. So some of the major ones include the job success and completion policy, which was introduced as an alpha feature in version 1.31. This policy is now graduating to beta with some improvements. The other one is traffic distribution to services, also introduced as an alpha feature in version 1.30. It is now moving to beta, again with enhancements. The node memory swap feature. This feature was in beta in version 1.28. And as discussed in our 1.28 video, it is now stable with improvements. 
Well, that is all for today. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Let us know in the comments what your thoughts are and what are the other videos that you'd like to see from us. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, goodbye.